An Iranian oil tanker is seized by British Marines off Gibraltar, apparently on orders from the United States. What's behind this dramatic move? And how can Europe navigate the escalating tension between the US and Iran? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. An Iranian oil tanker is at the center of a growing international dispute. British Marines boarded and detained the ship on Thursday as it was sailing near Gibraltar, a British territory on Spain's south coast. The UK believes it was violating European Union sanctions by carrying Iranian oil to Syria. Spain says it was the United States that ordered the vessel be stopped. Iran condemned what it called an illegal interception and summoned the British ambassador to Tehran. The US and Iran have been engaged in a war of words for months as Washington pressures Tehran to renegotiate the 2015 nuclear deal. This action arose from information giving the Gibraltar government reasonable grounds to believe that the vessel, the Grace One, was acting in breach of European Union sanctions against Syria. In fact, we have reason to believe that the Grace One was carrying its shipment of crude oil to the Banyas refinery in Syria. That refinery is the property of an entity that is subject to European Union sanctions against Syria. The US National Security Advisor John Bolton called their detention excellent news. A former commander of Iran's Revolutionary Guard is threatening retaliation, saying if Britain doesn't release the Iranian oil tanker, it is the authority's duty to seize a British oil tanker. Let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Tehran, Hassan Ahmadiyan, Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Tehran. In Berlin, Ali Fatullah Nejad, a visiting fellow at the Brookings Doha Center. And in Washington, D.C., Jeff Stacey, a former U.S. State Department official under President Barack Obama. Welcome to you all. Uh, I'd like to begin in Tehran first. The Brits have made their move. Uh, the U.S. National Security Advisor, John Bolton, seems to be positively giddy about the whole thing, calling it excellent news. What does Tehran do next? Of course, uh, uh, Tehran see it in line with the recent, uh, you know, actions that have been taken by the Brits with regards to Iran and the JCPOA. Uh, with, for instance, in the in the Fujairah incidents, uh, the Brits have came out without any uh, evidence uh, suggesting that Iran was uh, behind it, uh, while the UAE itself said uh, there is no, uh, you know, uh, anything that links Iran to the incident. Uh, on other, uh, you know, issues, the downing of the U.S. spy jet or a spy drone, the uh, Brits also endorsed the U.S., you know, rhetoric and uh, narrative of it. And I think, uh, basically, in recent months, uh, London has been, uh, you know, reflecting whatever the White House had to say. This incident, I think, is in line with that uh, shift in uh, London's, uh, you know, uh, policy with regards to Iran. Because up until now, ever since the sanctions have been in place, the EU sanctions on Syria, uh, there, there hasn't been any incident. But now... So uh, uh, the Iranians, basically, the general mood here is that the Brits are doing what the United States wants, and uh, it's in line with their uh, policy of bandwagoning with the United States against Iran. But you uh, were, so, you were uh, sending the oil feeling. to Syria against EU sanctions. You're not supposed to do that. That's... Of course, that's EU sanctions, not Iran sanctions. They, the, the EU is now, or the, Britain, the, the, the Brits are doing what the United States, the Trump administration, has been doing. That the administration has been imposing unilateral sanctions and penalizing and, you know, pressurizing others to abide by them. The EU is imposing sanctions and, uh, you know, uh, forcing other or trying to force others to uh, abide by them, which is itself the EU, including uh, the Brits, have been criticizing the United States for. 
Let's bring in Washington, D.C. here and Jeff Stacey. Jeff, you worked on the original JCPOA deal. Uh, you know a lot of the players involved. This deal has now almost completely broken down. Um, is there any way back for the U.S. on this? Is there any way back for Iran on this? Do you see this as being a, a moment where there's an opportunity or have you given up on, on this deal ever being seen through again? We're not fully giving up on the deal, and the Europeans aren't, although this is certainly a signal to the Iranians that they probably are. And so we've got all sorts of perception problems here, and the likelihood is that uh, the deal, in terms of Iran's adherence to it on enrichment levels and these sorts of things, they'll probably push the ante even more, violate a few more provisions. But the real concern is what's going to happen right in the region with the different um, capacities and pieces of military equipment that are in place. We're probably going to see now another move by Iran to lash out and target someone either directly or with its subsidiaries in the region, such as the Houthis or others. And that's where the real danger is here that the red line that uh, this administration has out there could be moved right across and then an exchange takes place and then a rapid escalation. That's the real danger here. We're more and more boxed in. So the agreement, that's not really the greatest concern here. That can be gotten back in line with relatively quickly. The real problem with the military assets in the region and how close to each other they are and the difficulty now in terms of any kind of military exchange targeting of another piece of either U.S. or allied military forces, that is the real issue at this stage. It is a very serious issue, but you, this administration, they did put those military assets there. The Iranians were sticking to the deal, uh, according to your own sources, the, the White House itself, under President Obama, they were very happy that, with the way the Iranians were sticking to the deal. Then this administration changes everything, and suddenly we have those assets in the region. This is warmongering, classic warmongering, surely. It is. I mean, the Trump administration is guilty of starting this entire crisis, so... There's that fault, and there's plenty of it lying around. The difficulty now is that the Europeans do not want this deal violated. And the Iranians are pushing the ante here by essentially aligning the Europeans with the Americans because they're really out of moves. Everyone is boxed in here. The U.S. is boxed in. Iran is boxed in. That's why the danger level is going up and the tensions are going up. The sources of this, quite rightly are entirely the fault of the U.S., but now we're in a really dangerous situation right there in the Gulf with these assets, and that is the problem. There are red lines on both sides. We need to get back to discussions, and obviously sanctions lifted and moving to a new deal, et cetera, et cetera. Let's bring in Ali Fatullah Najed, uh, who's a visiting fellow at the Brookings Doha Center. He's actually in Berlin right now. Do you see a way out of this for both sides? Is there something, is there a way of backing down? Well, um, the entire situation is very difficult. And um, so there is uh, not, um, I mean, the only way out would be that um, both Tehran and Washington become more flexible. So that, for example, Washington announces to Tehran beyond, uh, you know, the signal that they're uh, actually willing to talk without preconditions, as President Trump recently said, to signal to Tehran that they would uh, be uh, willing to stop some of the sanctions. And uh, this would uh, send a positive signal to Tehran and maybe give them uh, some uh, courage to enter into negotiations, because uh, so the Iranian perspective for the last few months was that they're in a position of weakness and there is no uh, th there is no reason to engage in talks with the United States. Although the debate is much more uh, multifaceted in Tehran, surely. But uh, for now, we don't have the green light from the supreme leader of Iran, which is uh, an absolute necessity. So we see, at least rhetorically, uh, for now, more willingness to talk from the American side than from the Iranian side. But be as it may, we might say a different dynamic uh, if Iran decides to go uh, beyond, uh, to go, uh, to move towards 20% uh, of low-enriched uranium uh, in the next few days. 
And this might um, create a new dynamic uh, inside of which the Europeans uh, will find it very difficult to continue the kind of political and diplomatic support vis-a-vis uh, -vis Tehran. So all this kind of um, uh, play of brinkmanship from uh, the US and the Iranian side of the last few uh, weeks and months is now entering a critical stage. Uh, let me bring in Hassan here in Tehran. Uh, you heard what our guest in Berlin had to say. Uh, is there a way for the Iranians to come back to the negotiating table and turn this around, or is it simply too late? I think Iranians have never left the negotiation you know, uh, table. They, they have been there. It's the United States that got out of the, 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 uh, from the negotiating table and uh, tried to bring Iran on its own terms to another negotiating table. So this is clear. The United States violated the deal, then uh, imposed the sanctions that were lifted as part of the deal, and then forced others to, you know, uh, abide by those sanctions, and now is, you know, ratcheting up the pressure, the maximum pressure. And, uh, I mean, the, the, the point that your guest from Washington brought up, that everybody's boxed in, I think that's correct, but the, the party that is suffering is Iran. It's not the EU, it's not the United States. So Iran sees uh, the, the, the way that the EU is dealing with the U.S. sanctions as, uh, as a violation of, it, of its own commitment within the deal. So it's, it's basically, it's not working against the EU. It's basically doing what the EU and the United States is doing. They, they basically got back from their commitments. They got back to the first square where the negotiations started and led to the JCPOA. And Iran basically is, I think, is heading back as well to the first square to be equal, I mean, to, to deal with them on equal footings. Uh, and I think that's, that's a, a choice that has been made in Tehran. Iranians cannot, basically, the, the authorities here, the, the ruling elites cannot, uh, you know, afford to basically rule back and kneel be, behind, before uh, U.S. Uh, maximum pressure. They have to create a leverage as to go to, an, if, if they are to go to another uh, round of discussions or negotiations, provided that there will be uh, a willingness on the other party. But I think uh, what's important for Iran now is the economics of the U.S. sanctions, and the EU is not doing basically its part of the deal. Uh, and Iran is right, uh, 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 rationally so, Iran is, you know, pressurizing the EU and the other parties to the deal to live up to their own commitments within the deal. That's actually a very interesting question. Let me bring in uh, Ali Fatullah here in Berlin. It's not actually illegal to transport Iranian oil around the world. Those are unilateral sanctions being placed on um, by the US on Iran. So it's actually quite legal to transport oil around the world. It's much more difficult to sell it, and Iran does need money. Now, because it's being squeezed so much, do you feel that the Iranians are now absolutely desperate to get hold of cash and that's why they took such a risky move, uh, allegedly, by trying to get this oil to Syria? Or do you think this has just been happening for a long time now? Well, I mean, first of all, um, so the Iranian oil shipment towards Syria, I'm not sure if uh, in return the Iranians would get back cash from the Assad regime. So basically what was happening during the last few years is that basically Iran was providing a lot of uh, material and other help to the Assad regime and uh, not really in return for money and for cash. I mean, so this is not the issue. The, um, I think the timing of this incident is very um, interesting because it comes after the European Union has announced that a special uh, purpose vehicle, which is a bottom mechanism set up by the European Union called Instax, is going to be operational. And, um, and this would, of course, not be substantive because, uh, as it is, it stands now, um, through the through Instax, uh, actually not really massive and significant transactions can be made uh, between Europe and Iran. But at least symbolically, uh, this EU move uh, uh, is uh, is a signal to Washington that the EU is actually circumventing U.S. sanctions. And uh, so when so this is incident in Gibraltar was um, at. Um, the behest of the Americans. 
and uh, precisely at a time as well when uh, the um, acting uh, foreign minister of Spain, Mr. Borrell, is poised to become uh, the next EU uh, foreign policy chief. And this puts uh, Mr. Borrell also in a very difficult situation, talking about infringement, possible infringement of sovereignty of Spain by Britain. And it's, um, so if uh, this is a calculated move by the United States to do this at this particular timing, this is also a way to drive a wedge uh, among the Europeans in this critical juncture. Uh, but as such, the incident is not uh, that significant. It is only uh, that significant because it comes uh, within the context of escalating uh, tensions between the two sides. Let's bring in Washington, D.C. here. The European Union has played a negotiating role between the U.S. and Iran in the past. It has been part of the JCPOA talks. It has... The Iranians have felt for a very long time that they did have friends within the European Union that they could... Uh, Talk, could talk to and they could uh, lean on in times of toughness. The, we, in the last few months, what we've seen, though, is the EU not really acting uh, the way it said it would act when it came to the Iranians and this deal. How much of that is to do, as our guest in Tehran says, is just pandering to Washington? Well, there's a bit of that, but uh, the most important thing here is that the Europeans can do something beyond just enforcing or not enforcing sanctions, including related to this tanker's seizure. What they should do, in, in particular France and Emmanuel Macron, is step in and mediate. Uh, the Japanese Prime Minister Abe tried to do this, but it was at a time where there was no real off-ramp for the Iranians, and so it wasn't really appropriate in, in, in terms of the sequencing. But there is now an opportunity, right when everyone is boxed in, with very few moves to make to save face, as it were, it's time for France to come in, especially because they're not doing what they should be doing over in Libya with the support of General Haftar. There's a grand opportunity here for France and the rest of the EU to come in and broker a new deal. Remember, Trump, he's really only opposing this be because of domestic considerations, because this had to do with President Obama. He'll sign something, as he's done with a trade deal, that looks relatively similar to the previous deal. So Iran can think about that, take that on board strategically. With the push from the Europeans, there's a real opportunity to get a sub, couple of small sanctions relieved, get back to the table. Iran could think creatively about what else it could offer so this deal looks just somewhat different and we can get back to adherence to it and moving forward into the next chapter of this. We're in the third phase of this crisis. We need to move through the fourth phase where the tensions actually start to come down and they're back at the negotiating table. Hassan in Tehran, it's an interesting point, isn't it? Surely one worth talking about what President Donald Trump wants is not the JCPOA, he effectively wants the TCPOA. He wants the Trump Comprehensive Plan of Action. Why don't you just give it to him? Well, I think, uh, to begin with, Iran was not happy with the JCPOA in the first place. Both parties came down from, uh, you know, uh, from their uh, demands, ideal uh, deal that they had in mind and got to the JCPOA. And now you have the United States reneging on the same deal that Iran was not happy with, asking it to step even uh, back even further. So uh, the Iranians, basically, the question here in Tehran is that what should we offer now? I mean, uh, the entire nuclear file uh, to the United States, Iran's, you know, uh, leverage in the, in the region that is basically and very uh, effectively, uh, you know, uh, is used as a deterrent means or Iran's ballistic missiles, that the only basic, you know, defense uh, means that Tehran has. These are the questions. What, what can we offer to Trump? And if it's not JCPOA, it's GCPOA. It would be, of course, different from the JCPOA. And the Iranians were not happy with the JCPOA. And surely they won't be uh, with another version of it that the Trump administration can sell within the United States. So uh, Iran's choice is not... Uh, and I think the other question is, who can we trust in the United States? I, I mean, the, the administration violated a, a, a deal that is a part of uh, international uh, law. It, it, it has been endorsed by the UN Security Council. The, that administration cannot be trusted. That's the essence of uh, many of the arguments 
that has been made here in Tehran. And I think there's a, as much as there was a consensus to go with, uh, for a deal with the uh, Obama administration and the previous administration, there's a consensus here nowadays is felt uh, on, uh, in, the, in the decision making uh, circles and uh, elites that we shouldn't do that with the Trump administration, at least for, not for now. Let me bring in Ali in Berlin here. Ali, you've heard what both our guests have had to say. They've stated their positions very clearly. There doesn't seem to be any common ground right now. Will there be any common ground under a president like Donald Trump? Well, let me start by saying that um, it is true that uh, last year the crisis was kicked off after the Trump administration unilaterally basically violated the nuclear deal, although Iran was sticking to uh, its side of the commitments. But the Iranian strategy ever since, uh, this kind of strategic patience, has not been successful. It, it has been basically to uh, bank upon the Europeans to help them out, to, be, uh, to provide them with the economic benefits of the deal. But giving uh, the power uh, constellation in the international order, where the United States is still the predominant power in the international financial and banking system, the, the sanctions reimposed on Iran have been much more forceful than uh, a lot of observers have been, uh, uh, have, have been thinking that, that, that they might be. And uh, so uh, the other part of the Iranian strategy is by doing so, they would be able to drive a wedge between the Europeans and the Americans. But the reality remains that the, the Europeans will not be able to uh, provide Iran with the economic benefits uh, of the deal as long as U.S. sanctions are still in place. So at the end of the day, um, so Europe is basically out of the picture. It's basically down to Iran and the United States to sit down and talk, despite uh, the aspects of the legality and illegality that my colleague from Tehran mentioned. Um, this is uh, how the situation is. And um, the Iranians have been quite successful uh, during the past few weeks and months to show not only to the United States, but also to uh, anti-Iran allies of the United States in the region that the cost of a military confrontation with Iran would be very, very high. And uh, on the other side, also the tr Trump himself, uh, you know, seems not to be interested in a large scale military confrontation. And Let me just say, so sorry, is, we are running out of time. Uh, sorry, Ali, we are running out of time. And I want to bring in yeah. uh, Jeff Stacey in Washington, D.C. here. Should the Iranians simply wait out President Donald Trump? No, they shouldn't, because the tensions are likely to lead to a military exchange well before the president leaves. And, of course, everything could go relatively back to normal were someone like Joe Biden uh, to come into this, and that would be a good thing. But uh, the Europeans are not out of the picture. There were quiet discussions still going on right up until uh, the enrichment uh, violation was announced. And that quiet diplomacy now needs to become both quiet behind the scenes and loud out in front of the scenes, brokering, getting the sides back to the table. Someone like Macron could get President Trump to listen and release a few of the sanctions in order to get back to the table. And Iran could think creatively about what else it could do in here, because, of course, if you look at the Houthis, for example, in Yemen, they've got increased capabilities. And they are actually in the, some of the attacks, especially most recently on one of the Saudi airports, you know, killed some civilians. So there's some things like that that could be added to the deal that would make the entire region more secure and more peaceful. And what we want to get back to is an Iran that is, has normal relations with the world and, and everyone with it, economically viable again, and moving away from pushing confrontation around the region and to a new era, really. And this, ironically, could even happen during the Trump administration. We just need to dress up the discussions and the provisions of a new deal slightly differently it's not as difficult as everyone seems to believe it is. Uh, gentlemen, we are out of time. I want to thank you all. Hassan Ahmadian, Ali Fadola Nejed, and Jeff Stacey. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the whole team here, bye for now.